Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this talk hosted by the Malta Institute of Professional Photography. We are very happy to have with us Kent Wisner, who is an, a good friend of mine by now. Um, he's an American fine art photographer. He is trained in international law and, sorry, forgive me, in international relations and law by, by profession. But he's had this, this passion for photography and actually before that for printed for quite a number of years. Um, Kent actually started as a printing analog work when he was still in college. So he actually learned how to print before actually learning photography. But with time he evolved to to turn to photography. It has some very particular styles of photography, which I find very, very highly artistic. And I think you will enjoy this talk. The talk tonight will be about one of his greatest passions, which is platinum palladium printing. It's uh, quite a beautiful way of, of printing prints, and you will have ample experience to, to see that with, with Ken today, who is a master palladium printer himself. So I leave you in the good hands of Kent Wisner. Kent Wisner, everybody. Thank you, Charles. Um, I appreciate it. Um, and everyone, just to confirm, everyone can see the screen with the slides. We can, Kent, yes. Okay. Um, okay. As uh, Charles said, I've been a serious photographer for about 40 years. Uh, I've been doing monochrome prints in platinum and palladium for about five years, and it's become a labor of, of love. Um, as Charles also mentioned, I, I learned to print before I learned to operate a camera. When I was in college, everyone had gone home on a holiday, and um, a friend uh, suggested that I follow him into the dark room to help him print his midterm project for a photography class, and I was hooked immediately. I was drawn to the magic of making a physical image appear, the precision of the science, and the, but yet the need to make it feel right uh, with artistic choices, and to the notion of permanent mo moments frozen in time and preserved, even as they are moments that cannot be repeated. And I just loved watching the image emerge. So photography became an interest of mine, but the first time I saw Robert Mablethorpe's flowers, it was in the 1980s at a Chicago hotel called the 21 East. Uh, he had done a series of flowers for the decorate the entire hotel, and I fell in love with them. I was drawn to his stunning total ranges and beautiful, rich, dark details and luminous highlights. I didn't know anything about his process at the time. I just knew that his flowers spoke to me. And I later came to learn that he rendered many of them in platinum. And so my journey began. I started looking at platinum and palladium and other types of archival printing processes and taking note of the special qualities of each. I did start in film, but the world and I transitioned to digital in 2001. And again, I began a quest to match the quality and permanence of darkroom prints with digital capture and pigment inkjet printing. And now I've returned to combine the digital and the analog worlds in both cameras and in printing. In 2016, in search of uh, the magic of a print and to preserve the permanence of a captured moment, I took a workshop in platinum and palladium printing uh, with a master printer named Karak Kuklis, uh, who is an artist in residence at the Yosemite National Park in California, uh, following in the footsteps of Ansel Adams. I think these kinds of prints are beautiful and subtle and luminous, uh, and it's been my passion ever since, and, and here's why. They're unique. I'm drawn to many things about the platinum process, but uniqueness for one, because the process is so handmade and there are so many small technical and artistic choices uh, along the way that no two prints will be exactly the same, 
even if they are made by the same person with the same negative and the same chemical processes. They are also extremely archival. It is one of the most archival photoprint methods ever discovered with the longevity determined by the paper itself rather than the image on the paper. These noble metals, platinum and palladium, bind with the paper fibers themselves and then don't degrade in tone or density over time. Traditional darkroom prints deposit images in an emulsion that sits on top of the paper and remains somewhat light sensitive uh, over time. Pigment and inkjet prints deposit ink into a coating also on top of the paper, and that coating can fade or separate over time as well, de depending on conditions. Although traditional darkroom prints last 25 to 50 years and modern digital pigment inks can last 75 years or more, there are platinum prints that still exist from the 1800s when the process was invented and papers that can last hundreds of years. This method of printing also has a tonal range that's hard to match. Platinum and palladium prints celebrate the midtones. It's an elongated tonal range, more gradations between of gray and midtones than other methods, creating subtle transitions arguably not available with other methods. The color tone of these prints can be on a spectrum from cool gray to slightly warm to very sepia. And they have a luminosity about them. I think platinum prints have a luminosity that's hard to convey without actually looking at some of the uh, prints themselves in, in physical form. Uh, but I'm going to try to um, give you some examples throughout the talk today that will, that will demonstrate that. So what are platinum prints? The process was developed in the mid 1800s along with salt prints, albumin, and then silver-based emulsions that dominated black and white photography for most of the modern era. Platinum prints or platinotypes are contact prints, meaning the negative has to be the same size as the print itself. They are monochrome images that are made using certain noble or precious metals, platinum and palladium, that react to ultraviolet light when mixed with certain other elements, principally iron. Uh, palladium adds smooth transitions among the, the midtones, and platinum adds contrast to those midtones. There are four modern variations on the platinum palladium printing process. There's a traditional method that just uses those two metals. Um, there's a so called NA2 method that uses. Uh, certain salts to uh, add contrast. There's something called a zeotype, and there's a process, modern process, called a mauled wear process. I use the NA2 method, and it's the one I know the best, and so I'll be referring to that one from here on out. For the chemists out there, here's how it works. UV light, Sorry. UV light plus ferric oxalate yields ferrous iron. And once the ferrous iron has become formed, the iron is available to change platinum salts into, into pure platinum or palladium metal. That second reaction binds the platinum or palladium to the paper fiber itself. And that's what creates its permanence. Platinum and palladium printing needs a good negative that is the same size as the desired prints uh, for the contact printing process. Under ultraviolet light, not an enlarger process. So you need a camera as large as, the, you used to need a camera as large as the print you intended to make. And here we have uh, Irving Penn, uh, a famous platinum printer, with his four by five camera that he used to make four by five prints. 
But then came the digital revolution. And this has caused a resurgence in platinum and palladium printing because people have invented ways of printing enlarged negatives from digital files. Now you can have a 16 by 20 negative without having to have a 16 by 20 camera. And you can scan smaller negatives, 35 millimeter medium format or even four by five large format and create a digitally printed negative that is much larger, eight by 10, 11 by 14 or 16 by 20. So what's the process look like? The first thing you need is you have to have a good photo. And then you need a photo that's going to make a good platinum print. The two are not the same. Uh, why do I like this photo? Um, I like it because of its geometry. I like the rectangles and the triangles. I like the shadows. Um, but I also like that it asks a question of what are you going to do when you get to the top of the stairs? There's, there's no door. <laughs> so to me, I see some symbolism in this for myself about making sure that if I'm going to set uh, hurdles to jump over or stairs to climb, that I am intentional about uh, the direction I'm going and why I'm doing it. So, a good platinum print will have an elongated tonal range, especially varied and subtle tonal gradations in the midtones. And this image actually prints well in platinum because of those shadows with the uh, garage door and the texture in the stones uh, on the facing side of the building. What doesn't make a good platinum print? Images that rely on deep liquid blacks that are better rendered in silver. Um, platinum can get reasonably black, but not like silver. The so-called D-max of the black range on this method of printing isn't, isn't as black as some of the other printing methods. Platinum doesn't do well with high contrast and high key images, again, because its strength is in the midtones. And so block shadows and blown highlights won't be treated very well in this process. So after you have a photo, what you need is you need a negative. But you have to create a negative that's designed for the transmission of analog light at the same size as the desired print. Getting such a negative printed on an inkjet printer is essentially a three-step process. The first step is you have to have a black point in your printing process. So you have to know how long to expose the, ne the negative you have, given it's not completely clear, not, it's somewhat opaque um, of the printing me mediums we have. So you need to know your exposure time that will give you the, the minimum exposure time for a maximum black uh, in your negative. Once you have your black point, then you need your white point. The white point is a function of how your printer, your inkjet printer, lays down ink on the substrate, the, the clear film that you're using. Um, some people use different colors of ink because they're better at blocking UV light. Uh, yellow is actually a better blocker of UV light than uh, any other color. Uh, so you have to correlate your exposure time to get blacks. You have to correlate how much ink your printer puts down uh, to get white because it has to completely block out the, uh, in the negative, it has to completely block out the UV light in order to get pure paper white. The third step is the most difficult, and that's linearization. Without this adjustment, prints will look flat and muddy. Uh, there are many methods in Photoshop and other programs to linearize. But effectively, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get this digital set of information to behave like the analog world. And as many of you know who've done studio light work, 
light behaves according to a logarithmic scale at the square root of two. To cut light in half, you don't move the light source twice as far away, you move it 1.4 times as far from the original spot. A negative by making light pass through shaded areas is weakened by the light on the same logarithmic scale. So the shading of a digital negative must be made for light, not for the human viewer of that negative itself. Thus, a digitally printed negative for the platinum process will look very odd if it's just viewed as a positive on the screen or on printed white paper. If you don't linearize, when you print, effectively all these beautiful midtones in the middle grays will get squashed up into the upper right of this tonal scale on the screen. They need to get spread more evenly across the middle. There are many ways to linearize. Um, the one I use um, is done with curves in Photoshop. Uh, there are other techniques which use gradient maps uh, to create uh, that same sort of thing. I use a program called Quick Curve Digital Negative by Richard Boutwell uh, and Photoshop Adjustments. Um, there are many good printers out there. Uh, you know, I happen to use an Epson printer. Um, but it's the important thing to realize is that you have to have a different linearization curve for each pairing of UV lights and printer and for each alternative process. You know, one for platinum, one for albumin, one for cyanotype, one for Van Dyke browns, kalinotypes, et cetera. Because they all, the sensitizer materials, which I'm about to talk about, react differently in, in all of those processes. So making sure these midtones are spread evenly uh, is a calibration which does take some time. And it is the most difficult part. Um, and many people get frustrated at this stage, but I urge you to uh, persevere. So once you have a negative, that where you have a good uh, black point, you have a good white point, and you've linearized, linearized sorry, um, your curves, then you're ready to make a print. And you have to mix some sensitizer chemistry. One of the great things about this process is you don't need a dark room. The chemicals only react to, ultra, react to ultraviolet light. Incandescent lights that are more yellow than blue don't affect the print. So you can do this work without complete darkness or special red darkroom lights. You just have to keep sunlight away uh, or filter that sunlight through a yellow um, curtain or something similar. You mix the chemicals in a shot glass. Uh, a word of caution about the chemicals. They, they, one part of these chemicals does involve oxalates. Oxalates occur in nature. They can be found in rhubarb leaves, but are generally slightly toxic. The process I use only uses a few drops per print. I stay away from oxalate developers, but there are several oxalate developers that work really well. You just need to be careful about handling them and disposing them of them properly as chemical waste. And gloves are recommended. You then, after you've mixed your uh, sensitizer chemicals in your shot glass, you pour those chemicals out over the paper and uh, apply it with either a brush or a glass rod. Um, I like the brush because I can control it better some people like a glass rod because the brush does absorb some of these chemicals and the chemicals can be expensive. Um, you then let the sensitized paper after you very, you very, very carefully brush the sensitizer chemicals over the paper very evenly so there are no streaks or brush marks or pools of, of, of wet sensitizer and you let it dry. Ideally, uh, you want the humidity in the room to be above 40% and uh, ideally between 50 and 60%. In Malta, that's generally not a problem. If anything, some of the humidities I've printed under are a little higher. 
Uh, if the print is too wet, if the humidity is too high, then the sensitizer will uh, stick to the negative itself, and that can cause some, uh, some undesired uh, effects in the print. So you let it dry. Uh, you then put it into a contact printing frame in what's called registration. Some processes uh, involve multiple coatings and multiple prints uh, of the same negative on the same thing. So you have to make sure the negative is completely aligned from print to print. I only use a single registration, so I don't have to be that careful. I just have to make sure the negative is uh, positioned over the sensitized area. Then you expose it under UV light uh, for the maximum black exposure time. Uh, and then you develop. Uh, you put the exposed print into uh, some developer, and then you, you get to see the image come forth almost immediately. It only takes a, about a minute uh, for the image to appear. And then the rest of the development process is about clearing the chemicals out of the paper uh, and rinsing it and then letting it dry in a way that uh, maintains the archival nature of the print. You don't want these chemicals residually in the paper because uh, you want an acid-free, oil-free uh, uh, image uh, for when you, uh, uh, you end up framing it or keeping it in a, in a cool, dry place. Um, there are different methods of drying. I, I hang mine as depicted here. Uh, there are some famous printers, Beth Moon for one, who uh, lays her prints out on a sheet of glass and uses a, a squeegee to um, take excess water off of the rinsed print and then lets them dry flat on the, gra on the glass. That, that takes longer, but ensures a very flat print. So that's the basic process. Uh, what I'd like to, I'm going to go back through the process and, and illustrate um, what artistic decisions you make at each step. Um, but before I talk specifically about platinum, I want to talk about artistic decisions in general. Now, there, there's a school of thought which says that an image should speak for itself right out of the camera. And some people don't think that even cropping should be allowed, that that's somehow cheating. Uh, as Charles said, I started out as a printer before I was a photographer, and most printers wouldn't agree, would disagree with that school of thought. Even in the world of traditional black and white processes, dozens of corrections and edits were made for contrast and luminosity and emphasis of composition. Here's an example of an iconic photo of James Dean by a famous celebrity photographer named Dennis Stock. And his master printer was a fellow named Pablo uh, Inerio, uh, who printed also for Carter Bresson and others. Um, and I was able to find uh, the printer's notes. So um, on the left, you see the final print. And on the right, you see the contact print and the printer's notes of all the different uh, dodging and burning and, and other uh, edits were going to be made in the printing process to come up with the, the now famous photo on the left. In the platinum printing process of digital negatives, these editorial decisions are made in Photoshop and with a variety of dodging, burning, and curves and, and other adjustments. Uh, some just to the image itself and some to render it to maximum effect of midtones in the, in the uh, platinum and palladium process itself. The first uh, decision to be made is about tonality. Uh, this is a photo of Pablo Picasso by Irving Penn. It was taken in 57 and printed in 74. This is a very cool platinum print. Uh, you'll notice the, gr the grays are more on the blue end of the scale, but you can also see that, you know, the detail in the, uh, the shaded eye under the hat um, uh, and the detail in the black collar of his coat uh, really showing off what platinum can do. 
Um, here is a much warmer print by Alfred Stieglitz in the 1890s. Um, to get cooler tones, you use whiter paper. You use more platinum and less palladium because palladium is a little warmer. And you make choices about developer. An ammonium citrate developer um, will produce a cooler tone than a potassium oxalate developer. Uh, the ammonium citrate can add grain. I personally don't, uh, don't mind it. Warm tones, besides the potassium oxalate developer and a higher proportion of palladium, can be done with ecru or beige papers. Basically, any 100% cotton uh, art paper can be uh, used for platinum printing. The next image is by my teacher, Karak Kuklis. Um, his style is to achieve warm tones that he believes give a sense of history uh, and just appeal to him aesthetically. But this image is also demonstrates the luminosity of this type of printing process. And it has that telltale platinum glow. He does this by using warm papers, a full daylight spectrum of exposing light, not just UV light, and warm potassium oxalate developer. Uh, potassium oxalate uh, will produce a warmer image if the uh, temperature of the developer itself is physically warmer. Um, if it is only room temperature, it will be slightly cooler. So you can dial up all of those variables to get a warmer tone with potassium oxalate. Um, you can control contrast with traditional mixes of platinum and palladium or with modern contrast agents like um, sodium chloroplatinate. Uh, you can use adjustment curves applied to the negative in Photoshop uh, in addition to the standard linearization process. And you can do dodging and burning of the negative in Photoshop. Texture, uh, you can apply through paper choices. I use Hanamil Platinum Rag and Burger COT320. Uh, Arches Platine and Revere Platinum have higher textures. Uh, platinum Rag is, is a flatter, smoother paper. You get grain out of your developer choices. You can get grain from ISO choices in the original image capture. Uh, you can also remove grain with noise reduction software that's quite a, uh, amazing these days with the advent of AI. So now I wanted to take you through my process. Charles was kind enough in the first iteration of this uh, talk to share with me a negative that he has been active in preserving from a well-known Maltese artist from the late 1890s. And I had the pri pri privilege of seeing if I could do that negative justice with a practice print. It's a great image that made a beautiful platinum print. So for my sensitizer ca chemistry, I used mainly palladium with just a few drops of Na2 uh, for contrast. And when I needed extra contrast, I used curves in Photoshop. For my developer chemistry, I used ammonium citrate to get a cooler tone. It also happens to be more eco-friendly. There's no, it's no more dangerous to me or the environment than many kitchen cleaners or citrus juices. Some people complain that this developer produces more gr grain in the image, and I haven't seen that, but it's a trade-off I would make to have a less toxic, more environmentally friendly process, um, and that's important to me. And my uh, grow light, my light source are some so-called grow lights or hyponic lights, uh, generally used for indoor plants and installed I installed aquarium lights to get a narrow spectrum of UV light more consistently. Some people just hang these lights from the ceiling at a consistent distance from the floor. I had a friend build me a wooden box so I could use it on a tabletop and could store it out of sight if I needed the space in my house for another use. Um, I will say that uh, when I imported grow lights to Malta, I got some questions as to whether I was uh, going to be participating in the burgeoning marijuana growing industry, uh, since that's what they were mostly used for. And I had to explain their photographic uses in order to clear customs. 
Uh, the paper I use is Hanamule Platinum Rag. It's very white. Um, I use a Burger COT320 as a backup, also very white. As a result, my prints tend to be cooler toned, uh, which fits my aesthetic taste better than warmer prints, uh, with all due respect to my uh, former teacher, Garrett Kuklas. But my process is also very eco-friendly, so I don't have to worry about how I uh, dispose of my chemicals. They can, they can go easily into the, the normal uh, household system. So thanks to the digital revolution, uh, what's been considered an antique process has been reinvigorated. There are far many more practitioners of this craft today than there were 20 years ago. The combination of digital cameras, computers, and chemical processes that are easily done with some spare space at home have found a way of making these fleeting moments permanent in a way that I really enjoy, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share that with you. Um, this is the image that Charles had uh, given me. Um, and that's how it looks just after it's been exposed. Um, and then you put it in a tray, and this is the ammonium citrate, which I'm about to pour on it. And as you can see, the image comes to life right away. And then over time, uh, the yellow sensitizer gets washed and rinsed away with some various chemicals. And at the first uh, iteration of this talk, I was able to hand this print to Charles um, in sort of full circle of taking an image from the 1890s and preserving it for another 150 to 200 years uh, with a print. Uh, made in 2020. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your, your kind attention.